Hey, if this is the first time you are visiting my channel, make sure you hit the subscribe button. Chapter number 7, Part 3 Organized Planning Take inventory of yourself. 28 Questions You Should Answer Annual self analysis is an essential in the effective marketing of personal services, as is annual inventory in merchandising. Moreover, the yearly analysis should disclose a decrease in faults, and an increase in virtues. One goes ahead, stands still, or goes backward in life. One's object should be, of course, to go ahead. Annual self analysis will disclose whether advancement has been made, and if so, how much. It will also disclose any backward steps one may have made. The effective marketing of personal services requires one to move forward even if the progress is slow. Your annual self-analysis should be made at the end of each year, so you can include in your New Year's resolutions any improvements which the analysis indicates should be made. Take this inventory by asking yourself the following questions, and by checking your answers with the aid of someone who will not permit you to deceive yourself as to their accuracy. Self-analysis questionnaire for personal inventory. Number 1. Have I attained the goal which I established as my objective for this year? You should work with a definite yearly objective to be attained as a part of your major life objective. Number 2. Have I delivered service of the best possible quality of which I was capable? or could I have improved any part of this service? Number 3. Have I delivered service in the greatest possible quantity of which I was capable? Number 4. Has the spirit of my conduct been harmonious, and cooperative at all times? Number 5. Have I permitted the habit of procrastination to decrease my efficiency, and if so, to what extent? Number 6. Have I improved my personality, and if so, in what ways? Number 7. Have I been persistent in following my plans through to completion? Number 8. Have I reached decisions promptly and definitely on all occasions? Number 9. Have I permitted any one or more of the six basic fears to decrease my efficiency? Number 10. Have I been either overcautious or undercautious? Number 11. Has my relationship with my associates in work been pleasant, or unpleasant? If it has been unpleasant, has the fault been partly, or wholly mine? Number 12. Have I dissipated any of my energy through lack of concentration of effort? Number 13. Have I been open-minded and tolerant in connection with all subjects? Number 14. In what way have I improved my ability to render service? Number 15. Have I been intemperate in any of my habits? Number 16. Have I expressed, either openly or secretly, any form of egotism? Number 17. Has my conduct toward my associates been such that it has induced them to respect me? Number 18. Have my opinions and decisions been based upon guesswork, or accuracy of analysis and thought? Number 19. Have I followed the habit of budgeting my time, my expenses, and my income, and have I been conservative in these budgets? Number 20. How much time have I devoted to unprofitable effort which I might have used to better advantage? Number 21. How may I rebudget my time, and change my habits so I will be more efficient during the coming year? Number 22. Have I been guilty of any conduct which was not approved by my conscience? Number 23. In what ways have I rendered more service and better service than I was paid to render? Number 24. Have I been unfair to anyone, and if so, in what way? Number 25. If I had been the purchaser of my own services for the year, would I be satisfied with my purchase? Number 26. Am I in the right vocation, and if not, why not? Number 27. Has the purchaser of my services been satisfied with the service I have rendered, and if not, why not? Number 28. What is my present rating on the fundamental principles of success? Make this rating fairly and frankly and have it checked by someone who is courageous enough to do it accurately. 
Having read and assimilated the information conveyed through this chapter, you are now ready to create a practical plan for marketing your personal services. In this chapter will be found an adequate description of every principle essential in planning the sale of personal services, including the major attributes of leadership, the most common causes of failure in leadership, a description of the fields of opportunity for leadership, the main causes of failure in all walks of life, and the important questions which should be used in self-analysis. This extensive and detailed presentation of accurate information has been included, because it will be needed by all who must begin the accumulation of riches by marketing personal services. Those who have lost their fortunes, and those who are just beginning to earn money, have nothing but personal services to offer in return for riches, therefore it is essential that they have available the practical information needed to market services to best advantage. The information contained in this chapter will be of great value to all who aspire to attain leadership in any calling. It will be particularly helpful to those aiming to market their services as business or industrial executives. Complete assimilation and understanding of the information here conveyed will be helpful in marketing one's own services, and it will also help one to become more analytical and capable of judging people. The information will be priceless to personnel directors, employment managers and other executives charged with the selection of employees, and the maintenance of efficient organizations. If you doubt this statement, test its soundness by answering in writing the 28 self-analysis questions. That might be both interesting and profitable, even though you do not doubt the soundness of the statement. Where and how one may find opportunities to accumulate riches. Now that we have analyzed the principles by which riches may be accumulated, we naturally ask, where may one find favorable opportunities to apply these principles? Very well, let us take inventory and see what the United States of America offer the person seeking riches, great or small. To begin with, let us remember, all of us, that we live in a country where every law-abiding citizen enjoys freedom of thought and freedom of deed unequaled anywhere in the world. Most of us have never taken inventory of the advantages of this freedom. We have never compared our unlimited freedom with the curtailed freedom in other countries. Here we have freedom of thought, freedom in the choice and enjoyment of education, freedom in religion, freedom in politics, freedom in the choice of a business, profession, or occupation, freedom to accumulate and own without molestation, all the property we can accumulate, freedom to choose our place of residence, freedom in marriage, freedom through equal opportunity to all races, freedom of travel from one state to another, freedom in our choice of foods, and freedom to aim for any station. In life for which we have prepared ourselves, even for the presidency of the United States. We have other forms of freedom, but this list will give a bird's eye view of the most important, which constitute opportunity of the highest order. This advantage of freedom is all the more conspicuous because the United States is the only country guaranteeing to every citizen, whether native-born or naturalized, so broad and varied a list of freedom. Next, let us recount some of the blessings which our widespread freedom has placed within our hands. Take the average American family for example, meaning, the family of average income, and sum up the benefits available to every member of the family, in this land of opportunity and plenty. A food. Next to freedom of thought and deed comes food, clothing, and shelter, the three basic necessities of life. Because of our universal freedom the average American family has available, at its very door, the choicest selection of food to be found anywhere in the world, and at prices within its financial range. A family of two, living in the heart of Times Square district of New York City, far removed from the source of production of foods, took careful inventory of the cost of a simple breakfast, with this astonishing result. Articles of food, cost at the breakfast table. Grapefruit juice, from Florida, 0.02. Rippled Wheat Breakfast Food, Kansas Farm, 0.02 Tea, from China, 0.02 Bananas, from South America, 0.021 Toasted Bread, from Kansas Farm, 0.01 Fresh Country Eggs, from Utah, 0.07 Sugar, from Cuba, or Utah, 0.07 
0.001 half. Butter and cream, from New England, 0.03. Grand total 0.20. It is not very difficult to obtain food in a country where two people can have breakfast consisting of all they want or need for a dime apiece. Observe that this simple breakfast was gathered, by some strange form of magic, from China, South America, Utah, Kansas, and the New England states, and delivered on the breakfast table, ready for consumption, in the very heart of the most crowded city in America, at a cost well within the means of the most humble laborer. The cost included all federal, state and city taxes. Here is a fact the politicians did not mention when they were crying out to the voters to throw their opponents out of office because the people were being taxed to death. B. Shelter This family lives in a comfortable apartment, heated by steam, lighted with electricity, with gas for cooking, all for $65 a month. In a smaller city, or a more sparsely settled part of New York City, the same apartment could be had for as low as $20 a month. The toast they had for breakfast in the food estimate was toasted on an electric toaster, which cost but a few dollars, the apartment is cleaned with a vacuum sweeper that is run by electricity. Hot and cold water is available, at all times, in the kitchen and the bathroom. The food is kept cool in a refrigerator that is run by electricity. The wife curls her hair, washes her clothes and irons them with easily operated electrical equipment, on power obtained by sticking a plug in the wall. The husband shaves with an electric shaver, and they receive entertainment from all over the world, 24 hours a day, if they want it, without cost, by merely turning the dial of their radio. There are other conveniences in this apartment, but the foregoing list will give a fair idea of some of the concrete evidences of the freedom we, of America, enjoy. And this is neither political nor economic propaganda. See Clothing Anywhere in the United States, the woman of average clothing requirements can dress very comfortably and neatly for less than $200 a year, and the average man can dress for the same, or less. Only the three basic necessities of food, clothing, and shelter have been mentioned. The average American citizen has other privileges and advantages available in return for modest effort, not exceeding eight hours per day of labor. Among these is the privilege of automobile transportation, with which one can go and come at will, at very small cost. The average American has security of property rights not found in any other country in the world. He can place his surplus money in a bank with the assurance that his government will protect it, and make good to him if the bank fails. If an American citizen wants to travel from one state to another he needs no passport, no one's permission. He may go when he pleases, and return at will. Moreover, he may travel by train, private automobile, bus, airplane, or ship, as his pocketbook permits. In Germany, Russia, Italy, and most of the other European and Oriental countries, the people cannot travel with so much freedom, and at so little cost. The miracle that has provided these blessings. We often hear politicians proclaiming the freedom of America, when they solicit votes, but seldom do they take the time or devote sufficient effort to the analysis of the source or nature of this freedom. Having no axe to grind, no grudge to express, no ulterior motives to be carried out, I have the privilege of going into a frank analysis of that mysterious, abstract, greatly misunderstood something which gives to every citizen of America more blessings, more opportunities to accumulate wealth, more freedom of every nature, than may be found in any other country. I have the right to analyze the source and nature of this unseen power, because I know, and have known for more than a quarter of a century, many of the men who organized that power, and many who are now responsible for its maintenance. The name of this mysterious benefactor of mankind is capital. Capital consists not alone of money, but more particularly of highly organized, intelligent groups of men who plan ways and means of using money efficiently for the good of the public, and profitably to themselves. These groups consist of scientists, educators, chemists, inventors, business analysts, publicity men, transportation experts, accountants, lawyers, doctors, and both men and women who have highly specialized knowledge in all fields of industry and business. 
they pioneer, experiment, and blaze trails in new fields of endeavor. They support colleges, hospitals, public schools, build good roads, publish newspapers, pay most of the cost of government, and take care of the multitudinous detail essential to human progress. Stated briefly, the capitalists are the brains of civilization, because they supply the entire fabric of which all education, enlightenment, and human progress consists. Money, without brains, always is dangerous. Properly used, it is the most important essential of civilization. The simple breakfast here described could not have been delivered to the New York family at a dime each, or at any other price, if organized capital had not provided the machinery, the ships, the railroads, and the huge armies of trained men to operate them. Some slight idea of the importance of organized capital may be had by trying to imagine yourself burdened with the responsibility of collecting, without the aid of capital, and delivering to the New York City family, the simple breakfast described. To supply the tea, you would have to make a trip to China or India, both a very long way from America. Unless you are an excellent swimmer, you would become rather tired before making the round trip. Then, too, another problem would confront you. What would you use for money, even if you had the physical endurance to swim the ocean? To supply the sugar, you would have to take another long swim to Cuba, or a long walk to the sugar beet section of Utah. But even then, you might come back without the sugar, because organized effort and money are necessary to produce sugar, to say nothing of what is required to refine, transport, and deliver it to the breakfast table anywhere in the United States. The eggs, you could deliver easily enough from the barnyards near New York City, but you would have a very long walk to Florida and return, before you could serve the two glasses of grapefruit juice. You would have another long walk to Kansas or one of the other wheat growing states when you went after the four slices of wheat bread. The rippled wheat biscuits would have to be omitted from the menu because they would not be available except through the labor of a trained organization of men and suitable machinery, all of which call for capital. While resting, you could take off for another little swim down to South America where you would pick up a couple of bananas and on your return, you could take a short walk to the nearest farm having a dairy and pick up some butter and cream. Then your New York City family would be ready to sit down and enjoy breakfast, and you could collect your two dimes for your labor. Seems absurd, doesn't it? Well, the procedure described would be the only possible way these simple items of food could be delivered to the heart of New York City, if we had no capitalistic system. The sum of money required for the building and maintenance of the railroads and steamships used in the delivery of that simple breakfast is so huge that it staggers one's imagination. It runs into hundreds of millions of dollars, not to mention the armies of trained employees required to man the ships and trains. But, transportation is only a part of the requirements of modern civilization in capitalistic America. Before there can be anything to haul, something must be grown from the ground, or manufactured and prepared for market. This calls for more millions of dollars for equipment, machinery, boxing, marketing, and for the wages of millions of men and women. Steamships and railroads do not spring up from the earth and function automatically. They come in response to the call of civilization, through the labor and ingenuity and organizing ability of men who have imagination, faith, enthusiasm, decision, persistence. These men are known as capitalists. They are motivated by the desire to build, construct, achieve, render useful service, earn profits, and accumulate riches. And, because they render service without which there would be no civilization, they put themselves in the way of great riches. Just to keep the record simple and understandable, I will add that these capitalists are the self-same men of whom most of us have heard soapbox orators speak. They are the same men to whom radicals, racketeers, dishonest politicians and grafting labor leaders refer as the predatory interests, or Wall Street. I am not attempting to present a brief for or against any group of men or any system of economics. I am not attempting to condemn collective bargaining when I refer to grafting labor leaders, nor do I aim to give a clean bill of health to all individuals known as capitalists. 
The purpose of this book a purpose to which I have faithfully devoted over a quarter of a century is to present to all who want the knowledge, the most dependable philosophy through which individuals may accumulate riches in whatever amounts they desire. I have here analyzed the economic advantages of the capitalistic system for the twofold purpose of showing. One that all who seek riches must recognize and adapt themselves to the system that controls all approaches to fortunes, large or small, and two to present the side of the picture opposite to that being shown by politicians and demagogues who deliberately becloud the issues they bring up, by referring to organized capital as if it were something poisonous. This is a capitalistic country, it was developed through the use of capital, and we who claim the right to partake of the blessings of freedom and opportunity, we who seek to accumulate riches here, may as well know that neither riches nor opportunity would be available to us if organized capital had not provided these benefits. For more than 20 years it has been a somewhat popular and growing pastime for radicals, self-seeking politicians, racketeers, crooked labor leaders, and on occasion religious leaders, to take pot shots at Wall Street, the money changers, and big business. The practice became so general that we witnessed during the business depression, the unbelievable sight of high government officials lining up with the cheap politicians, and labor leaders, with the openly avowed purpose of throttling the system which has made industrial America the richest country on earth. The lineup was so general and so well organized that it prolonged the worst depression America has ever known. It cost millions of men their jobs, because those jobs were inseparably a part of the industrial and capitalistic system which form the very backbone of the nation. During this unusual alliance of government officials and self-seeking individuals who were endeavoring to profit by declaring open season on the American system of industry, a certain type of labor leader joined forces with the politicians and offered to deliver voters in return for legislation designed to permit men to take riches away from industry by organized force of numbers, instead of the better method of giving a fair day's work for a fair day's pay. Millions of men and women throughout the nation are still engaged in this popular pastime of trying to get without giving. Some of them are lined up with labor unions, where they demand shorter hours and more pay. Others do not take the trouble to work at all. They demand government relief and are getting it. Their idea of their rights of freedom was demonstrated in New York City, where violent complaint was registered with the postmaster, by a group of relief beneficiaries, because the postman awakened them at 7.30 a.m. to deliver government relief checks. They demanded that the time of delivery be set up to 10 o'clock. If you are one of those who believe that riches can be accumulated by the mere act of men who organize themselves into groups and demand more pay for less service, if you are one of those who demand government relief without early morning disturbance when the money is delivered to you, if you are one of those who believe in trading their votes to politicians in return for the passing of laws which permit the rating of the public treasury, you may rest securely on your belief, with certain knowledge that no one will disturb you, because this is a free country where every man may think as he pleases, where nearly everybody can live with but little effort, where many may live well without doing any work whatsoever. However, you should know the full truth concerning this freedom of which so many people boast, and so few understand. As great as it is, as far as it reaches, as many privileges as it provides, IT does not, and cannot bring riches without effort. There is but one dependable method of accumulating, and legally holding riches, and that is by rendering useful service. No system has ever been created by which men can legally acquire riches through mere force of numbers, or without giving in return an equivalent value of one form or another. There is a principle known as the law of economics. This is more than a theory. It is a law no man can beat. Mark well the name of the principle, and remember it, because it is far more powerful than all the politicians and political machines. It is above and beyond the control of all the labor unions. It cannot be swayed, nor influenced, nor bribed by racketeers or self-appointed leaders in any calling. Moreover, IT has an all-seeing eye, and a perfect system of bookkeeping, in which it keeps an accurate account of the transactions of every human being engaged in the business of trying to get without giving. Sooner or later its auditors come around, 
look over the records of individuals both great and small, and demand an accounting. Wall Street, big business, capital predatory interests, or whatever name you choose to give the system which has given us American freedom, represents a group of men who understand, respect, and adapt themselves to this powerful law of economics. Their financial continuation depends upon their respecting the law. Most people living in America like this country, its capitalistic system and all. I must confess I know of no better country, where one may find greater opportunities to accumulate riches. Judging by their acts and deeds, there are some in this country who do not like it. That, of course is their privilege, if they do not like this country, its capitalistic system, its boundless opportunities, they have the privilege of clearing out. Always there are other countries, such as Germany, Russia, and Italy, where one may try one's hand at enjoying freedom, and accumulating riches providing one is not too particular. America provides all the freedom and all the opportunity to accumulate riches that any honest person may require. When one goes hunting for game, one selects hunting grounds where game is plentiful. When seeking riches, the same rule would naturally obtain. If it is riches you are seeking, do not overlook the possibilities of a country whose citizens are so rich that women, alone, spend over $200 million annually for lipsticks, rouge and cosmetics. Think twice, you who are seeking riches, before trying to destroy the capitalistic system of a country whose citizens spend over $50 million a year for greeting cards, with which to express their appreciation of their freedom. If it is money you are seeking, consider carefully a country that spends hundreds of millions of dollars annually for cigarettes, the bulk of the income from which goes to only four major companies engaged in supplying this national builder of nonchalance and quiet nerves. By all means give plenty of consideration to a country whose people spend annually more than $15 million for the privilege of seeing moving pictures, and toss in a few additional millions for liquor, narcotics, and other less potent soft drinks and giggle waters. Do not be in too big a hurry to get away from a country whose people willingly, even eagerly, hand over millions of dollars annually for football, baseball, and prize fights. And, by all means, stick by a country whose inhabitants give up more than a million dollars a year for chewing gum, and another million for safety razor blades. Remember, also, that this is but the beginning of the available sources for the accumulation of wealth. Only a few of the luxuries and non-essentials have been mentioned. But, remember that the business of producing, transporting, and marketing these few items of merchandise gives regular employment to many millions of men and women, who receive for their services many millions of dollars monthly, and spend it freely for both the luxuries and the necessities. Especially remember, that back of all this exchange of merchandise and personal services may be found an abundance of opportunity to accumulate riches. Here our American freedom comes to one's aid. There is nothing to stop you, or anyone from engaging in any portion of the effort necessary to carry on these businesses. If one has superior talent, training, experience, one may accumulate riches in large amounts. Those not so fortunate may accumulate smaller amounts. Anyone may earn a living in return for a very nominal amount of labor. So there you are. Opportunity has spread its wares before you. Step up to the front, select what you want, create your plan, put the plan into action, and follow through with persistence. Capitalistic America will do the rest. You can depend upon this much capitalistic America ensures every person the opportunity to render useful service, and to collect riches in proportion to the value of the service. The system denies no one this right, but it does not, and cannot promise something for nothing, because the system, itself, is irrevocably controlled by the law of economics which neither recognizes nor tolerates for long, getting without giving. The law of economics was passed by nature. There is no supreme court to which violators of this law may appeal. The law hands out both penalties for its violation, and appropriate rewards for its observance, without interference or the possibility of interference by any human being. The law cannot be repealed. It is as fixed as the stars in the heavens, and subject to, 
and a part of the same system that controls the stars. May one refuse to adapt oneself to the law of economics? Certainly. This is a free country, where all men are born with equal rights, including the privilege of ignoring the law of economics. What happens then? Well, nothing happens until large numbers of men join forces for the avowed purpose of ignoring the law, and taking what they want by force. Then comes the dictator, with well-organized firing squads and machine guns. We have not yet reached that stage in America. But we have heard all we want to know about how the system works. Perhaps we shall be fortunate enough not to demand personal knowledge of so gruesome a reality. Doubtless we shall prefer to continue with our freedom of speech, freedom of deed, and freedom to render useful service in return for riches. The practice, by government officials of extending to men and women the privilege of raiding the public treasury in return for votes, sometimes results in election, but as night follows day, the final payoff comes, when every penny wrongfully used, must be repaid with compound interest on compound interest. If those who make the grab are not forced to repay, the burden falls on their children, and their children's children, even unto the third and fourth generations. There is no way to avoid the debt. Men can, and sometimes do, form themselves into groups for the purpose of crowding wages up, and working hours down. There is a point beyond which they cannot go. It is the point at which the law of economics steps in, and the sheriff gets both the employer and the employees. For six years, from 1929, to 1935, the people of America, both rich and poor, barely miss seeing the old man economics hand over to the sheriff all the businesses and industries and banks. It was not a pretty sight. It did not increase our respect for mob psychology through which men cast reason to the winds and start trying to get without giving. We who went through those six discouraging years, when fear was in the saddle, and faith was on the ground, cannot forget how ruthlessly the law of economics exacted its toll from both rich and poor, weak and strong, old and young. We shall not wish to go through another such experience. These observations are not founded upon short-time experience. They are the result of 25 years of careful analysis of the methods of both the most successful and the most unsuccessful men America has known. Stay tuned with me for more amazing chapters and you will learn how to think and grow rich. Hey, don't forget to subscribe my channel, make sure you hit the subscribe button below and click on the bell.